in the 19th century, in a world where religious cults are the only things people can still believe in, Christian missionaries are sent all around the globe to share the word of God. Specifically, a group of missionaries comes to a peninsula hidden by tall, iced mountains. The missionaries were not supposed to go there. It was not their path. They were driven. They've been led there by something. A sort of call. Something is calling them. Maybe God. Maybe something else. The missionaries go all around the peninsula looking for something they don't know. Forced by some kind of sixth sense. Dreams. Visions. In those Christian missionaries started to see something, a pyramid-like artifact. They didn't know what was going on, but started to worship it, drawing it on the walls of the caves set below ground. They may have believed it was a gift from God, and it was promising them the biggest gift, eternal life. Along with the artifact, the missionaries started to see something else. A tall, red man walking among them. A creature that was not human, but that they started to worship as well. Was that peninsula the promised land from God? Was that red man God himself? We can't know. But sure, after a long time, something happened. A menace appeared on the peninsula and started to hunt the missionaries. What it was and which are its origins is unknown right now, but we will soon discover what happened and where the creatures the missionaries saw came from. What happened to the missionaries is difficult to say. Did they die? Turn into those things they drew? become something else. What happened? What was the threat? Was it the creature drone? We will soon find out. One century later, in 1979, while the world did not know what happened to the missionaries and why they went on that site, a group of fishermen decided to leave the continent and go on a not well-known island. Here they build huts, fish, and stay for a while, worshipping the Christian god. Eventually, the fishermen will find out about a complex cave system below ground, rich in a special gold-like and electric material. The discovery led the fishermen to explore all the caves on the island. Days, maybe weeks after they started mining the mineral, something happened. There was something in the caves, something they couldn't understand and that was slowly subjugating their minds. What they found was a strange artifact made of this mineral. Somehow, led by something, they found it and it was calling them through dreams and visions more and more often. It was driving everyone mad, and soon people started to slowly die or turn into something they were not. Mass suicides, strange actions, worshipping the found artifact, fishermen couldn't even sleep anymore for entire months. Too many were subjected to the artifact, but luckily, a small group of fishermen resisted the visions and decided to stop this madness and split the artifact into six pieces. They believed that this could have stopped the visions and finally get their friends back. They hid all the pieces in the caves and protected them with crosses and crucifixes and it seemed to be the only thing to stop their possessed friends. But when the corrupted fishermen found out about their friend's betrayal, their reaction was merciless. Following the will of the visions, all the traitors were brutally killed and buried. There was no mercy, 
the corrupted fisherman tried to look around to get the artifacts, but managed to find only five out of six. Without the last one, everything was useless, and so were the corrupted fishermen. At this point, they were left all alone in the caves, in the forest, to die without hope. Nobody will welcome that corrupted land for more than 45 years. But the visions are still calling, and they will accept no failure this time. It's 2010. The pharmaceutical sector, with the latest development of technology, has increased a lot, but yet no one has discovered the real way to eternal youth. Specifically, there are two main companies that are trying to get it first, Sahara Therapeutics and Pathcorp. These are mainly focused on finding eternal youth, but not through technology or modern medicines. They believe that the secret is kept in the past by ancient artifacts. The challenge between the two companies comes to an end when finally a researcher from Sahara Therapeutics, Matthew Cross, discovers somehow an ancient artifact on a peninsula that seems to be able to deliver immortality and bring back people to life thanks to a sacrifice. It's the same site where the Christian missionaries disappeared. The peninsula is now populated by a sort of peculiar cannibal community. Not only primitive natives, but also religious members appear all around. Cannibals used to pray and worship their effigies, covering themselves in crosses and white paint. They feel a cult. What's going on is still a mystery, and so is the creature drawn by one of the missionaries, still unsolved. To proceed with experiments, Sahara Therapeutics will start building a full laboratory underground. But this is not giving enough. Even though the experiments on the artifact are giving good results, Matthew needs to find a cure way faster for his daughter with cancer, Megan Cross. So he decides to experiment with the first artifact on children. The first results are monstrous. Big masses of meat, arms and legs able to walk, inhuman creatures that nobody can understand. So, Armsy, Virginia and Calvin are born, all products of these experiments. Some will become mutant babies, others will be a better yet cruel result, becoming human-like mutants. Now we see, we see that this was the same destiny of the missionaries. It was never about natives of the peninsula, it was all about mutants coming from the artifact. Were the mutants already inhabiting the peninsula? Or were the missionaries the first to go there, find the first artifact, and give birth to mutants by reviving one of their friends? Everything is now explained. The missionaries came on the peninsula, led by something that sent them to the artifact, drawing it in their minds through dreams and visions. They started to believe it was a sign of God, a gift from God, visions from God and started to worship it. Once they found it, they used it to bring back people to life by sacrificing someone else that was later revived with the same process. This way, 
most of the missionaries were exposed to the artifact, and this slowly turned them into mutants and human-like creatures. That's why there is a sketch with their genius. And that's also how the still alive and not mutated missionaries died, killed by their corrupted friends. Then the mutated missionaries escaped the caves and started to live outside in a peaceful existence between those we so far call the cannibals and the mutants. Sahara Therapeutics will not reveal to the world the results of the experiments, nor the mutated population that inhabits the site, but will promote the new discoveries and the first artifact as the only way to immortality. More magazines will talk about it, and it will quickly become one of the most important arguments of that period. In the meantime, Matty Cross is leaving private tribals with his wife, who also asks for a restraining order. But when she threatens to keep her daughter and to ask for divorce, she mysteriously gets killed. At this point, Matthew gets his daughter to the artifact site, and this will lead to a tragic end. After a while, one of the mutated children will escape and kill everyone on his way. Matthew, one of the few survivors to the attack, decides to bring her daughter back to life, thanks to the first artifact. But in order to do that, he needs a new sacrifice. After other scientists reveal the tragic end of the experiments, Sahara Therapeutics decides to fire Matthew and to shut down the entire project. Nevertheless, Matthew will not stop and decides to use the second artifact to crash a plane on the side. Matthew will cover himself in red paint and pretend to be the tall red man that now the cannibals and then the missionaries used to pray. At the plane, Matthew finds the perfect sacrifice. A little boy called Timmy LeBlanc, son of Eric LeBlanc, a professional survivor and web star that had to keep his family alive after a tragic accident that took his wife's life. Unfortunately for Matthew, Eric is still alive and clearly sees him taking away his son. Once he wakes up, Eric will not stop he'll get his son back. Here starts the events of the forest. Eric will look for his son everywhere, above and below ground, discovering the cannibal population and the atrocities produced by the artifact. But his mind is not safe. He starts to see the red man that took his son everywhere, on the yacht, on the beach, everywhere he sees him. Was it only an illusion for what happened? Was his mind joking with his pain? Or was it a vision? Had it been subjected to the strange force that was living in that deadly land? Maybe yes, or maybe not. Eventually, Eric will find out about the secret laboratory set below ground and the atrocities it hides. The laboratory is full of dead bodies, caused by the mutated children that broke out previously. Keeping his promise to find his son, he will discover the first artifact. Into it, Eric will find Timmy.
While the pain for what happened is killing him, Eric notices that there is a dead man in a room next there. It is the Red Man, Matthew Cross himself. Once Megan came back to life, thanks to Timmy's sacrifice, she killed her father, the only man that made them possible for her. But now that Eric is here, staring at the one that took his son's life, he cannot accept what happened. As Matthew revived Megan by killing Timmy, now Eric will revive Timmy by killing Megan, still hidden in the laboratory. After Eric kills Megan, he will find out that everything was useless. The first artifact needs a live sample, not a dead body to be activated. Eric killed Megan, but this was not enough. At this point, a hopeless Eric will find the second artifact, the one that crashed his plane. He has a chance to save his son and do what Matthew did previously, or maybe just shut it down and end it once and for all.
after he and all the other survivors have been saved, Eric will publish a book about his personal experience and abominations the Sahara Therapeutics is now accused to have created. During a live event, Eric is invited with his son, and here Timmy shows the side effects of the first artifact. Is he okay? <laughs> Timmy will have mutations for his whole life and will spend most of it looking for a cure. And this will lead him to the second site, where not Sahara Therapeutics, but Pathcorp is plotting something. After the events of the forest, Sahara Therapeutics has been constantly charged and accused of illegal experimentations and tortures. This almost destroyed the company that was forced to take distance from the project led by Matthew Cross. Nevertheless, the company continued to look around the globe for other artifacts, as well as Pathcorp, led by the visionary billionaire Edward Pathton. Fifteen years later, on 11th July of 2025, Pathcorp wins a bidding war against Sahara and acquires a not well specified island. Later, Pathcorp will reveal that according to ancient texts found on it, the island is rich in solophyte, a mineral with anti-aging properties a special cube is made of. It is also revealed that the cube activates periodically and this will have incredible anti-aging effects. 14 days later, on 25th July, Pathcorp officially revealed to the world the founding of the Solophyte and its incredible properties. After the recent discoveries, an entire underground community for a select few, known as Holospring, is built below the island following a specific pattern, the Solanage Star Pattern. Holospring will allow only a few to join the activation of the cube and its effects, a sort of soft-opening for the future of the project. While the company is focused on building all these bunkers, soon Edward Pafton will find some abandoned huts on the east side of the island. These are the 1979 fishermen's huts, full of dead bodies. Though Pathcorps can't and won't reveal the founding of them, as all spring is quickly crowded by a select few, including Edward, Barbara and Virginia Pathton, founder family of Pathcorp. Even though nobody knows where the cube is set on the island, All Spring is getting a lot of attention and celebrity. Specifically, a friend of Barbara Pafton, called Doris Gilchill, is invited to Hollow Spring. She is the only person Barbara talks with about her concerns about his husband's sanity. It seems that Edward has been led to the island by some visions and dreams he had about the cube and about another reality. We now understand that there is something that's happening and that's leading all of this that caused the fishermen, missionaries, Matthew Cross and the same Edward Pafton to approach the artifacts. Now the question is, what is it? We will soon find out. Not only above ground, but also below ground, things are getting more and more mysterious. In one of the caves, on 12th February 2026, only seven months after Pathcorp bought the island, 
some spacemen appear out of nowhere. Along with them, there is a spaceship nobody knew about. What's happening? Where did they come from? Who are they? But mysteries are not over. In a bunch of days, on 26th of February, another important worker named Sammy disappeared in Cave C. Caves are now becoming dangerous places. People disappear, strangers appear in weird costumes, something is going on and nobody can get what's happening. Nevertheless, Pafton will not stop his research, and on 28th July, Tetsu Masaki, a Pafcorp scientist, finally decrypts the ancient texts. We finally know when the cube will be activated, exactly three weeks later, on 18th August. Edward is now sure that he will get to see what has been dreaming for all this time. Still, we don't know what he's looking for, what the cube will show him, but we will not wait any longer, as the day after, unknown yachts are found on the island. The Sons of the Stars have arrived. After the announcement of the new artifact, theories and conspiracies started spreading all over the world. Specifically, a group of cultists, known as Sons of the Stars, started looking for the new artifact, convinced it was the only way to the so-called Gold City. Cultists are mainly influenced by some theories on the existence of other universes and dimensions, especially those supported by Timmy LeBlanc. Remember this name? He was the son of the only survivor of the forest events. Sixteen years after he was brought back to life, Tim is still looking for a cure and for explanation for what happened. He started to believe there was another dimension where all those mutations and abominations came from. For this reason, he wrote a book called Parallel Universes and traveled between them. He quickly became the best and most known theorist about the existence of other universes. All of these theories just led the group of cultists to look for the new artifact, and they did find it. They arrived by yachts on the island and started to kill themselves. They're committing suicide in the name of a promised land, the Gold City. As Edward Pafton writes in an email sent on 21st May, 10 months after the acquisition of the island. But why are the cultists killing themselves? What's this Gold City? And how did they know where the island was as nobody revealed it to the world? Sons of the Stars are getting visions and dreams of the cube and about another universe that is promising them the gold city. Wait, do you remember this? It's the exact same vision Edward is having, the same that led the fisherman. Now everything is clear, the same force that has been leading fishermen and Edward Pafton is now also leading the cultists to the cube. They all were and are looking for the gold city. But just like what happened with fishermen, now also some cultists resist the influence of their dreams and visions and slowly turn against them. This will soon be noticed from the affected cultists who will soon kill all their corrupted comrades, the non-believers. This will lead to a real genocide on the island. Cultists kill the traitors the non-believers, workers and soldiers and then kill themselves following the will of the visions. And in the meantime, some of them, always listening to the voice of the dreams, are approaching the cube.
10 days before the countdown ends and the cube activates, Barbara Pafton once again writes to her friend Doris Gilchill, telling her about another nightmare Edward had about the soft opening for Hollowspring, dreaming once again about that gold city. Edward is now being worried about everything. He also started to think that maybe the bunkers were misplaced, that they were not in the correct pattern. At these words, Doris Gilchill doesn't know what to say. She has not paid for all of this. This was not supposed to be a cultist journey, but a luxury experience. We know that nobody in Hollowspring but Path Corp executives knows what Hollowspring is being used for. And while the time for the cube activation is getting closer and closer, Jian Yu Zhang, security assistant at the island, starts to investigate the real purpose of Allspring. He decides to get in touch with Tetsu Masaki, the scientist who decrypted the ancient texts and try to understand what's going on and what the cube is hiding. On 10th of August, eight days before the activation, Masaki reveals to Jianyu his worries about the countdown. Edward Pafton completely misunderstood it, and the cube activation could have catastrophic effects on everyone. The day after, Jianyu will answer Masaki, trying to assure him that Edward's nightmare are just bad dreams created by his fantasy land in which his mind lies. The countdown is a fairy tale. The gold city is a fairy tale. But that's not enough. After checking again the calculations, Masaki is even more convinced that the cube activation will be a complete massacre. It is also revealed that it happened several times in 900 Ante Domini and three times in the 70s. One of these activities caused the death of the fisherman back in 1979. In his own room in the residential bunker, Masaki keeps worrying about the countdown and soon discovers that what Edward has been looking for all this time is not happening in one week. The numbers are wrong. Something will still happen, but it will be a bloodbath. The real cube activation will happen only several months later, when they will probably no longer be alive to see it. On 12th August, only six days before the cube activation, something will raise doubts in Edward Pafton about Giannio. His stubbornness in seeking answers to his questions are a risk for all Hollowspring and for his own life. Maybe thanks to the visions, maybe to his sixth sense, Edward advises Hank Keyes, Path Corp executives, to contact Jack Holt, the author of a book about the billionaire's life, if something ever happens to him. Even though he's from the press, Edward trusts him and Jack will make sure to uncover his death. While Edward is taking security measures against Giannio, this one discovers a lot of dead bodies of workers and soldiers around the island, killed by those cultists that arrived a while before. The Sons of the Stars are now the main objective of Giannio's manhunt. On August 14th, after Edward Pafton did not whisper a word for his dead employees, Giannio decided to deal with it personally. In a couple of days, lots of cultists are killed by Gianni and his soldiers. Trying to get away. Not today. Another one. Oh. Boy. This. At the end of those two days, Edward Pafton discovered Gianni's brutality against the Sons of the Stars and decides to fire him and make him go away from the island. The day before the cube activates, Gianni leaves the island. In the meantime, Edward Pafton organizes a special event in the food and dining bunker, inviting one of the most known and radio music groups, the Bad Pilots. 
At the event, there will be almost everybody but Virginia, who won't attend it. The event is massive, and Edward promotes it as the biggest one organized by Holospring. Countdowns in every room, an announcement from the speakers, this was a big moment to celebrate. It was the 18th of August. Now it is time. While most of the Holospring community is busy with the Bad Pivots event, cultists decide to approach the queue. Somehow, maybe through the visions, they knew that to get into the queue, they had first to go through a cave that was accessible only by a gold gate located in Pafton's bunker, specifically behind their bathroom. They run and get into the bunker, killing every worker and soldier in their way, occupy all rooms and follow the instructions of their leader, Ivan. Only by blowing an entire bathroom in the luxury bunker, they get to the entrance of the cave, where an open gold gate is waiting for them. After they enter, they close the door behind and go through that cave better known as El Cave. Cultists arrive at the end of the Hell Cave. Most of them will die, and just few of them reach it. At this point, the cultists activate the cube. This has monstrous consequences, as everyone is transformed into mutants. Nobody survives but mutants. And then, the silence. Many weeks passed since the last form of communications from the island. Nobody knows what happened, nor where the island is set. But this is not the end of the story. On 18th March 2027, Chuck Duggar, probably a military recruiter, got to know about an unusual burst detected seven months before, exactly on 18th August, that had the same data as a dimensional switch. Two days later, Gianni Zeg got in touch with Chuck Duggar and revealed what was going on on the island. Knowing now its specific location, Gianni could go back to it and discover the secrets of the queue. The only way is to be in business with Duggar, who will be his man on the continent, and find the phones to assemble a squad. That's how Gianni contacted Sahara Therapeutics, the main antagonist of The Forest and rival to Pathcorp which was very pleased to help him and found him in a way Pafton never would. This way, Gianni can finally go back to the island. In a few weeks, a whole squad is set, choppers fly all around looking for survivors and answers. Gianni needs to know and will do everything he can to get to know what was in that queue. But not everything is controlled. In a note sent on 5th April, Chuck Duggar reveals the theorist that Tim Black is looking for the cube as well, despite his mutated arm. Timmy has probably been contacted by one of Pathcorp scientists on the continent, and now he is fully aware of what happened to the island. Gianni now has another menace, but will not hesitate to kill him.
After so much time without signals and communications, after the entire world watched Pathans disappear, Pathcorp is forced to send a team on the island to understand why they're not receiving any more information from Edward Pathton. The entire team will be killed by Gianni and his soldiers, and soon the entire chopper is burnt down. After the disappearance of Team A, it sent another squad on 28th April, in which also a press man is. Jack Holt has been contacted by Pathcorp following the will of the probably deceased Edward Pathton. He is the only one able to discover what happened on the island and reveal the truth to the world. Here start Sons of the Forest events. Jianyu decides to spare us and another soldier who was being injured during the crash. Unable to speak and to hear, Jack can only use a notebook to talk with him. His name is Rodney Crown, Kelvin for the squad. Together, they will start looking for answers, between the mutants created by the cube and lots of dead bodies all around the island. Still, they don't know what caused all of this. Jack will enter all the caves trying to get explanations, and soon will also discover little gold-like pieces. These are the pieces of artifact the fishermen have been looking around. He finds a total of four through the entire island, yet it's unknown what they can be used for. Jack will soon find out about the bunkers and the Hollow Spring underground community, and in the entertainment bunker he finds death and abominations. Specifically, from the swimming room, 
Jack notices that something left the pool and dragged himself out. Maybe another mutant. Maybe something else. Surprises are not over here, as he soon meets an unexpected figure. It's not safe here, you're running out of time! It's gonna happen again, you have to leave! The man emits his stimulant blank, who is looking for the cube. But what was he talking about? What will happen again? As Masaki found out, another cube activation is close, and no one is safe on the island. It's only a matter of time. Jack and Kelvin needs to find the cube as soon as possible. Once outside, the main characters will continue to explore the island and get hints on what happened. Not only workers and Pathcorp soldiers can be found around, but also Giannis Quotas found killed. Only a few survivors had the strength to raise their hands with the flares and seek for help. Too far too late, nobody will survive due to the injuries. Yet, Jack will find another surprise on his path. Virginia Pathcorp. She survived somehow, and she is all alone in a wetsuit, seeking for help but also she was affected by the cube activation. One more leg and arm appeared. Her fate has been far less terrifying than the others, turned into unspeakable creatures. Jack cannot leave her alone, and will soon team up with her, getting her a warm suit and taking care of her. Slowly, something will burn between them. A sentiment. Love. This adventure will link them for the rest of their lives. The research for answers continues, and soon Jake will also enter Cave D, finding something that nobody ever expected. Those are the spacemen that Pathcorp found out of nowhere. Along with them, there is a spaceship. In there, Jack finds something that he cannot explain. An ancient armor left between webs and dust that is holding a strange tool. It has a shape that he cannot understand. Something that doesn't seem to be from this world. Something that comes from somewhere else all these spacemen belong to. At one point, he realizes that it could maybe be linked with all the other artifacts he has found through the caves, and this theory is also strengthened by the fact that another piece of artifact is placed at the end of the cave. But it's still not working. Then, another piece is missing, the one that also fishermen didn't find. Five pieces of artifacts are not enough. Left Cave D, Jack will finally access the food bunker, where the bad pirates event took place. Here, Jack finds out what happened. Everyone mutated due to the cube activation, and so, also Barbara and Edward Pafton. There's no way to save them. The mutation is irreversible, and Jack is now forced to kill Pathcorp founders.
Exploring the entire island and all the spring structures, the main character will arrive to the residential bunker. Little Mutant Tim, all grown up. Although there's no trace of Janu, we can see Timmy trying to open the door for the luxury bunker, where the gold door is set. There's no much time. Jack needs to escape, open the luxury bunker doors so that Timmy can enter in. And right after he leaves the residential bunker, he finds a helicopter flying over his head. It was probably Gianni. He's moving towards the Hell Cave. Into the final bunker, we will find a blown up bathroom where cultists open the bridge to get into the Hell Cave. At the gold door, we find Timmy. There's gotta be a way to open this, a key. Something. Jack assumes that the key to open the door that was closed by the cultists is the ancient armor. No. No, we're, we're missing something. But that's not enough. Something else is needed. All that sulfite around, the fact that the mineral was so important and had a key role in all of this, the fact that all the pieces of artifact are made of this mineral, makes Jack realize that the Anzen armor is the key, but it's not ready yet. It is needed to upgrade it by melting sulfite and immersing the armor into it. That's the only way. Differently from the other caves, there are special mutants that inhabit it, and that have been called demons after cultists. It seems that they have used crosses to burn them alive. In the Hell Cave, Jack and Timmy fight against the mother of the demons, the biggest demon in there. Timmy struggles to fight it, and his arm slowly starts to mutate, the side effect of the first artifact. Together, you will defeat the demon mother and finally reach the cube.
It's time. No, 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 no! This was supposed to fix me. It's making me worse. in the pupil! What was in the...
You made it. You're okay. Oh god, they're coming. The artifact partially activated before leaving the island. It is its fate to stay there, and no one can take it away. But there's no time. Mutants are coming, and Jack needs to save himself with his friends Calvin and Virginia. It's time to leave. Calvin was recovered in an hospital for deaf and mute people. Virginia was operated and turned again human. She had the possibility to have her own good ending, live her dream life with Jack, delivering him a baby. It's getting worse. Look at me. Look at what I'm turning into. I need your help. I've told you I can't help you. And what about with this?
Tinley, after discovering that the cube did not heal him and his mutations, continued looking for a cure and using Solophyte, he finally was able to get it. He became one of the most known and important pharmaceutical leaders in the entire world by discovering the healing properties of Solophyte in a secret island full of this mineral. But once again, he will face another challenge, as he soon disappears on that island. What happened to him is unknown, and still nobody knows its location. But this is another story that will be told in The Forest Part 3.